Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar. My name is Jennifer Burnett and I am the Program Manager for Fiscal and Economic Development Policy here at the Council of State Governments. States often compete intensively to attract firms in emerging high-tech or science-focused industries. Today we are going to hear from two ex experts that will tell us about a better way to link up the significant human capital and expertise found in our state universities and re research institutions with private sector companies looking for those same resources. First up, we have Daniel Calto, who is the Director of Solution Services for Academic and Government Institutional Markets at Elsevier, where he currently works with the North American SciVal Consulting Team and on special projects globally. Prior to joining Elsevier, Mr. Calto was the Director of Research Strategy and the Director of Research Administration at Columbia University. He also worked as Director of Sponsored Programs Administration at New York University School of Medicine and in a variety of administrative and clinical positions at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. Mr. Calto has an MBA in Finance and International Business from the Stern School of Business at New York University. Following Mr. Calto, we will hear from Dr. Charlene Sankaran, the first ex Executive Director of the Research, Engagement, and Capabilities Hub of North Carolina, also called REACH NC, a new statewide comprehensive web portal to information on research expertise and capabilities at North Carolina's universities and research institutions. Dr. Sankaran holds bachelor's and master's degrees in electrical and computer engineering from Ohio University and a doctorate in biomedical engineering from UNC Chapel Hill. She previously served as assistant director of the North Carolina Department of Commerce's Office of Science and Technology. If you would like to ask our speakers any questions, please type them into the message box in the GoToWebinar side box, and I'll ask them at the end of the presentation. With that, I'll turn this over to Mr. Calto. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Can everybody see my screen and hear me okay? Looks good. Okay. Um, hello, I want to thank you all for joining. Uh, my name is Daniel Kelto, Director of Solution Services at Elsevier. I wanted to talk to you today about a recent trend that we've seen at both the university and state levels to implement systems that can be used by academics, industry researchers, and state economic development agencies and governments to facilitate university industry government collaborations at the statewide level. This is sometimes called the triple helix approach. Now the first trend that we see very strongly in the US is the development of statewide research networks. These systems strive to create a single cohesive and searchable network making up all academic researchers in the state. These networks are overwhelmingly open and public ones. They're freely available on the web, and they allow others, including industry scientists and government policymakers, to search for specific kinds of research expertise. Charlini will actually show you an a working example of a statewide system. State, provincial, and national governments have also been looking to custom analytical services to provide them with data-intensive reports and other capabilities that can help them better understand how their state is situated vis-a-vis -vis other states in research and development capacity. Now we know that states currently compete very strongly to attract industries with high concentrations of knowledge workers. And doing this successfully can mean better jobs and greater prosperity for states. A good example is Mitch Daniels. He's currently president of Purdue University, but before that he was a popular governor of Indiana and prior to that, he worked for Eli Lilly as president of their North American operations. So he was really able to help uh, create a successfully a strong and rapidly expanding biotech corridor in Indianapolis, drawing on his ties with university, industry, and government. So he, he really embodies someone who's worked uh, successfully at each node of the triple helix. There we go. Um, I wanted to lay out very quickly what my presentation will cover today. First, I want to talk very quickly about the global R&D landscape and the economic impact of R&D. Secondly, I'd like to give you a couple of examples of the problems that universities and industries 
looking to work together face and the payoff to solving some of those problems. Third, I'd like to explore a successful example of a strong triple helix partnership, namely the Research Triangle Park in North Carolina. Fourth, I'll very briefly discuss analytical reporting and how metro areas, states, and countries are using these analytics to better understand their competitive position in the rapidly changing global R&D landscape. And after that, we'll move on to Charlini's presentation. I wanted to talk to you briefly about the global R&D landscape and the economic impact of R&D. Now, the global landscape may seem remote from the economic, economic dynamics of U.S. states, but it's really not. We know changes in global R&D have affected and continue to affect global manufacturing locations and job creation rates in the U.S. And for anyone working in economic development, it's very important to understand these trends. Similarly, it's very important to understand the economic impact of R&D. This has been studied rigorously by economists and many others, and there's a clear role for R&D in the creation of high-paying jobs in metro areas. The world spends a lot on R&D. This chart represents 2012 R&D investment. As a whole, the world spent over 1.5 trillion on R&D in 2012. The leading countries in R&D spending are the US, China, Japan, Germany, and South Korea in that order. The changes in global expenditures in R&D have been growing faster than the growth of the world economy. Most of this growth is driven by East Asia and especially Chinese R&D spending. Chinese R&D spending has been growing 22% per annum over the last decade and a half. It's growing so fast that even countries like the U.S. and Germany, which have been increasing their R&D spending at the rate of inflation or more, has seen their uh, shares of world R&D spending shrink rapidly. You can see China in six years went from 4 to 14% of global R&D spending. So why are these countries like China, India, and South Korea very actively increasing their R&D spending and their investments? Because it pays off economically in the medium to long term especially. We know that decades of economic studies have shown that investments in basic and applied research pay off with very large net positive impacts. But those payoff lags can be from 20 to 30 years, uh, particularly for basic science. Um, an example of this is smartphones. Projections indicate that in 2013, 1.3 billion smartphones will be sold globally. And that market will rise to 7 billion phones by 2018. Two-thirds of the people in the world with internet connections get their connections only through their mobile phones. So what led to this revolutionary technology, the iPod, the iPhone, and this mobile revolution? Most of the fundamental research that allowed mobile telephony took place in the 1960s through the mid-1980s. It was funded by entities like the U.S. Department of Energy, the DOD, IBM, Army Research, the National Science Foundation, and even the National Institutes of Health. who was looking at MRIs, and that became an important uh, technology in mobile telephony. What are a few companies that have gotten their start in university R&D settings? Google, one of the most, world's most important and innovative companies, had its basic research funded by an NSF grant. SAS, which employs 11,000 people, began as a research project funded by Department of Agriculture at NC State to analyze crop data. Cisco Systems, Pacific Bio Biosciences, Genentech. The list goes on to thousands of companies. Most of these companies are SMEs. And we know that SMEs, or small and mid-sized enterprises, have accounted for virtually all the net job growth in the U.S. since 2008. And perhaps the most amazing statistic, at least to me, is MIT graduates alone have started over 25,800 active companies. If a company founded by MIT graduates formed an independent nation, the revenues for that nation would make it the 17th largest economy in the world. Within the U.S., these companies generate hundreds of billions of dollars and, and over a million jobs. The global impact of these companies is more than $2 trillion in annual sales. I mentioned one key trend that we're seeing is the use of statewide research networking systems. 
what are some of the problems that research networks and systems are trying to solve? And what's the potential payoff for solving these problems? I was recently at a state science and technology institute conference in Portland, Oregon, which is a gathering of uh, statewide economic development folks, and heard a fascinating presentation on the efforts of Portland State and Intel to work together. Now, in many ways, these, are, these two are an odd couple. Portland State is Oregon's largest university, located in the heart of downtown Portland, a few blocks from Intel Labs. It's an urban university with a diverse student body and many international and non-traditional students. While it has a good engineering program, it's not among the elite engineering schools. It's not Stanford. It's not MIT. Intel, in contrast, is a Fortune 500 firm. It's Oregon's largest private employer, along with Nike. And it has a very strong and global R&D presence a huge amount of R&D spending as part of its company's DNA. Nonetheless, these two wanted to strengthen their existing partnerships. And when they examined uh, the, the relationships they had, they found there were hundreds of contacts between Portland State researchers and Intel industry scientists. Almost all of these created on an ad hoc basis. In the words of the Portland State Director of Tech Transfer, who co-presented with her counterpart from Intel, she said they were looking at a plate of spaghetti. In order to unravel that plate of spaghetti, it took them literally nine months of working out the relationships that they had without a research network. So it took them nine months to create what they called an asset map. Despite all of this work and the nine months they spent, they felt that the payoff for this was very large and worth this effort. The two institutions now have a framework that defines four major areas of collaboration. And this framework has been yielding major benefits to both the university and the company. An example of this is the Intel Vietnam Scholarship Program. So Intel's newest test facility in the world is in Vietnam. But the level of instruction there was deficient. So Intel worked with Portland State to create a special program for Vietnamese students to get a bachelor's in engineering. These graduates then became facilities managers when they returned to Vietnam. They sent 73 students for this. Uh, Intel, in particular, considered this to be an extremely uh, effective program because it got around the problem of university graduates not being fully pre prepared to take on industry positions. These graduates actually did practical work in the Intel labs with R&D scientists, as well as doing coursework at the university. Now, this wasn't just a benefit to Intel or the Vietnamese students. Over 1,000 Portland State graduates, 80% of whom came from Oregon, work at Intel out of a total six work workforce of 16,000 in Oregon. So a mid-ranked a mid school is a, uh, has one out of the 16 employees employed by Intel in Oregon. And that's come directly out of this relationship and the fact that they've built a strong working partnership together. So that's of great benefit economically to the state of Oregon, to the benefit of the students, and to the benefit of the university. Not only the Let's take a look at a specific example of a successful university industry government partnership, namely Research Triangle Park in North Carolina. This park's model is now widely imitated globally with varying degrees. In the 1950s, North Carolina had the second lowest per capita income in the country. It was ranked lower than any state but Mississippi. It was considered to have very poor economic prospects, and out-migration from North Carolina was severe. The Research Triangle area of North Carolina, which comprises the three cities of Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill, now has the second highest concentration of PhDs in the country after Cambridge, Massachusetts. The Research Triangle has 170 companies, 40,000 high-tech workers, um, and it's had 1,800 startup companies uh, that have come out of there since 1970. Now, it has a lot of key characteristics that drive its success. First, there are high levels of uh, integration between industry and the university with a broad variety of companies in the park. The park has lecture series, conferences, where industry scientists, academics, and state policymakers meet and discuss issues. About 40% of the companies have fewer than 10 employees. As these succeed or fail, they move in new startups. There are other models for industry-university partnership. The software industry in Israel, 
Silicon Valley, Route 28, etc. The connection of academia to industry is a well-established one, but it's also a very complicated relationship. There is no successful way to bridge the valley of death between promising applied research and successful industry startups. A structure like RTP can help. One reason it succeeded, though, was done very early. It was done in the 1960s, and the, the area had a lot of natural advantages in terms of labor costs, transport links, et cetera. Now, one of the most difficult bridges to cross when you deal with academic industry partnerships is successfully crossing what they call the valley of death. It's very hard to take a pro promising applied research findings at a university and successfully convert them to viable and profitable companies. So based on all the evidence we've had, all the studies that have been done, what are the most appropriate roles for academia, business, and government? In general, universities play a constructive part only in the earliest initial stages of building a viable economic business. This area on the left on the slide that you see. Universities do research basic and applied more productively than any other element of our society which is why most federal dollars go to universities. However, many of these same researchers are not skilled in create, creating businesses. Many CEOs and industrial scientists will tell you that the fundamental breakthroughs in their disciplines, like aeronautics for Boeing, virtually always come out of academic research. Most of it's funded by the government. Without this process, there's no seed corn for R&D industry intensive businesses. However, other people besides academics tend to be best suited in terms of skills and temperament to build businesses and drive a firm out of the other side of the valley of death. Entrepreneurs, financiers, professional managers. Most new businesses fail. Those who start them need to be persistent, optimistic, and willing to take great personal and career risk. This personality profile doesn't describe most academics or most people, so you really need entrepreneurs and risk takers are the ones best positioned to create new businesses. And what about governments? Governments bring the most benefit when they provide solid and stable financing for the universities. Without government funding, most long-term research is simply not funded. Payouts are too far away for companies facing tough global competition. And frankly, the days of Bell Labs and Xerox Park, those are pretty much over. Governments can reduce red tape, defer or reduce business taxes, and support incubators. They shouldn't try to pick economic winners and losers, but if they can create a healthy ecosystem for competition, that can be very beneficial. Now, when university researchers, entrepreneurs, and government policymakers all focus on the things when they can, the areas where they can make the most, the, the strongest contributions. Research networking systems can be used to enhance and leverage potential collaboration and increase knowledge dissemination. Research networking turns what's now an ad hoc and haphazard process of finding relevant research expertise into a much more systematic and effective process. And again, we'll hear more examples uh, of how this works later from Charlene. I want to touch briefly on the additional types of analysis that we can perform that may be of value to state economic development agencies and policymakers. One capability that we have that allows us to look at collaboration maps for any institution. We have these maps for over 4,500 universities and government laboratories across the globe. They allow a detailed analysis of collaboration patterns in any major field or subfield of science. So this map represents uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory. And the white circle is of institutions where there's a co-authorship relationship. We can drill down into the map uh, and look at an individual institution. These are the collaborations that Los Alamos has with one. We can also look at this data in a tabular format and for any major subject areas like math and physics, a specific discipline like sensors and actuators. Also have maps, Intel, Pfizer, Google, etc. We can even look at uh, national maps of competencies. A map of the, which has over 1,800 research competencies, um, and it has top authors, and top institutions for every single one of these 1,800 competencies. Each of the small circles you see within the large circle is a specific 
competency of the United States. We can also look at other nations where we see India, uh, China, Germany, and the UK with very different patterns of uh, research strength. Frequently asked to provide specialized reports and analysis by governments, scientific academies, universities, and corporations. And we have a dedicated team that does that. A good example of this is the kind of advanced analytical reporting we can do for government. This report was commissioned by the UK government's Department of Business Innovation and Skills, which is an economic development organization for the UK national government. They wanted a detailed study, which this is about 80 pages long, track the UK's position in the global R&D landscape, which I described earlier is rapidly uh, changing, especially with the rise of new research economies like China. So, um, this publication had a major impact on UK uh, national policy, and they recently asked us to provide a 2013 update and expansion of the study. We've also done a study with the world's oldest scientific society, uh, looking at uh, global network pattern, global networks of science uh, with the Royal Society. Um, for the BIS report, we use not only uh, Elsevier data, we work with a lot of large and publicly available data sets like OECD data, uh, data coming out of the UN, out of the World Patent Office, etc. And we can do a wide variety of analyses using the, the content that we have. This is a brain circulation map of the U.S. It shows how scholars circulate in and out of the U.S. from other countries and how American faculty go abroad. Now, given the time constraints, I won't go into details, but when we look at this map with other country maps, there's a huge amount of interesting information. The data show very conclusively that the more open a national research economy is, i.e. open to outside talent from other countries, the better it performs in terms of scientific. So the UK and the US have the most world's most open research economies, and they also have the world's highest scientific impact. In the same way we look at the US, we can also do these types of analyses for a state. So here's an example of uh, for the state of Ohio. And finally, we can even look at where people are migrating from and going into. I'd like to stop here and introduce uh, Charlene Sankaran. She's the executive director of ReachNC. ReachNC is the first statewide network of research expertise to be implemented in the United States. Now, again, as with the establishment of the Research Triangle Park in the 1960s, once again, North Carolina has shown its capability to innovate and take the lead in an emerging trend. Dr. Sankaran, uh, well, you heard her background, but she has a PhD in biomedical engineering and a master's in electrical engineering from Ohio. And before becoming executive director of ReachMC, she worked with Burroughs Welcome and Sigma Psi, the Scientific Society in Research Triangle Park. So she also has deep ties to Reach Research Triangle Park. Charlene is going to talk about the history and use of ReachMC and give a short demo that shows how the system can be used by economic development professionals and other key stakeholders in Charlene, let me just uh, transfer uh, uh, rights to you here. Thanks, Daniel. This is Charlene, and while we wait for um, Daniel to transfer the presenter rights, I'll just um, start talking. So, reach and see as. Daniel said and Jennifer said earlier is the Research Engagement and Capabilities Hub of North Carolina. Um, all right. We are truly a statewide partnership of research institutes, higher education, universities across North Carolina. So I think everyone could probably see my screen now. So I'll go ahead and just give you a very brief overview. I'm going to give you a little bit of a background of how REACH got started and what our purpose and mission is, how does it work, and I'll do a brief demo and um, share with you a little bit of the impacts that we've started to see and some of the success stories coming out 
of the collaborations that have been made. Um, our website, again, is www.reachnc.org. I'm on Twitter at ReachNCHub. So um, if any of you tweet, go ahead and please follow me. Um, so really, the impetus for ReachNC has been swirling for years. And there's been this question of, you know, North Carolina has tremendous university expertise. Duke, we've got um, North Carolina State, we've got UNC Charlotte down in Charlotte, we've got UNC Chapel Hill. But as you can see with this quote from an economic developer at a university, it often took several phone calls and days, maybe even a week or two, to find the right person to talk to to help you with your technical question or collaboration. So ReachNC was really born out of this idea of making university expertise more easily accessible to the general public, to other university researchers, and to economic developers. So as I mentioned, ReachNC is a searchable statewide portal that allows North Carolina to tap into its own pool of experts and resources. ReachNC is powered by Elsevier SciVal Solutions. We are the largest, um, the largest statewide networking research networking system. We have 19 North Carolina higher education and research institutions represented, and close to 9,000 expert researchers visible online that you can search through. Our goals, again, are to increase the transparency and the visibility of research expertise across our state and to allow for more efficient and effective location of experts for various purposes, as you'll see further on. And as I mentioned, ReachNC really is a true partnership of universities and economic development agencies statewide. Um, the initial impetus for REACH started from the North Carolina Tracks Institute, which is a translational clinical sciences institute in our School of Medicine, with NC State University and the partnership of Duke to put um, information about the researchers online. And we soon realized the benefit of making this a statewide initiative. So the first phase was in 2011, there were pilot profiles from UNC Chapel Hill and NC State that were released on the ReachNC site and joined in January 2012 by 15 other University of North Carolina System Institutes and again expanded with Duke and RTI last, last June. And we recently added two more small institutions the um, central staff at the University of North Carolina system, which is a 17-campus public university system, and the North Carolina School of Science and Math, which is a residential high school here in North Carolina. So as you see, we're continually growing. Um, we plan to release more profiles next year and add more institutions. So in some ways, REACH is a work in progress that's never done. Um, so you may ask who benefits from ReachNC, just from conversations and analysis of web traffic and how we know people are using the site, we're able to break the audiences for ReachNC into four general segments. We have a pretty significant portion of the audience is internal, so consisting of the faculty members themselves who are profiled on the site and university research administrators who use REACH for various purposes. On the external side, we get inquiries from the general public. And by and large, the business community in which I include economic development organizations and economic developers benefit from the information that's aggregated on the website tremendously. So I just wanted to point out a few examples of how REACH has been helpful to make those connections for the internal audience. We know that people have used REACH to help researchers identify collaborators outside their existing network. I had a friend from graduate school, actually. I ran into her, and she said, hey, hey, I used your thing. I was writing this grant proposal, and I needed to find someone to help me with this very particular um, 
technical expertise in nanomaterials, and she told me the name, but I don't remember it. And she said, I used your thing, and I typed in the name of the technology, and I was able to find someone, and we're writing the grant proposal together. So I'm not sure if the proposal got funded or not, but just the fact that um, that she was able to find somebody to help collaborate on the grant proposal, I think, is a success for REACH. We know that university administrators use REACH to aggregate information for internal and external reporting. It has been a huge time saver for people who have to report on um, publications, faculty grant activity, and things like that to be able to find this information on REACH. Um, frequently, university administrators hear about awards and um, funding opportunities that may have a narrow range of eligibility. People usually use REACH NC to identify faculty that may be eligible for those awards. Um, people use REACH NC for speakers, mentors, reviewers, you name it. Um, here's a quote from Kathy Sidner, who works at the UNC system. Her job is to increase the number of connections and increase the number of um, or the amount of Department of Defense funding that comes into the state of North Carolina. North Carolina has a tremendous military base and we have just a tremendous opportunity to match our, our defense contractors, our veterans, and our researchers to, um, to procure funding for the latest DOD initiatives and the latest in cutting edge research that may help our military. Kathy says she uses Regency just about every day. She has just great networks with um, local stakeholders such as the Army Research Office and Army Special Ops. So they, they called her and said, here are the technical challenges we're facing. Here's where we need some expert consultants. Um, Kathy is able to use Regency to find the expert that she can then refer to to help solve the technical problem. So, Switching tax a little bit externally, people are using Reach NC in much of the same way to find reviewers, to find speakers, to find collaborators. Um, we have heard from, for example, a microscope company that had an advanced microscopy technology. They wanted microbiologists to test their new lines of microscopes. There was an economic developer who has used REACH NC successfully for two economic development projects. Both of them are related to um, biofuels and renewable energy. The economic developer and the company, they, they wanted an external expert to assess the proposal to see, you know, is this project really going to generate the amount of energy we think it is? Are we going to be able to control emissions? Are we going to be able to con conform to standards? So this particular expert called me, and we were able to use REACH NC to identify several faculty members in um, engineering and environmental science that could help with that project. So we get, and then just from the general public, we get a lot of requests for mentorship. We get requests for past publications and research, just people interested in a particular research area. Um, even our own. North Carolina Department of Commerce Secretary, Secretary Sharon Decker, I'm very pleased to hear that she personally has used REACH NC. She's, um, this is a story she told me, and I've tried to capture it in her quote right here. They had a vaccine manufacturer that they were meeting with, and this manufacturer was looking to expand operations in North Carolina, and, you know, as if there's anyone on the webinar that's an economic developer, you know that such companies are probably looking at multiple sites. Um, and workforce is sometimes a deciding factor. Secretary Decker told me that she was able to use REACH NC to pull up the vaccine experts in our state and point to how many people we have here. So this is, again, an ongoing project, but I'm hopeful that REACH NC played some small role in um, retaining this vaccine manufacturer and helping them to expand. So even though we're still growing, REACH NC is still a work in progress, we're starting to see some of the really um, nice successes coming out of it, and I'm glad that it's starting to do what we're hoping it would do. So at this point, I'm going to um, do a quick demo of REACH NC, and bear with me a little bit. The, the servers have been a little slow lately. Um, 
This is the landing page, www.reachnc.org. This just contains some history, our sponsors, some video tutorials that you can view on how to search the site, contact information, and you can access the database either by clicking profiles up here or by this green bar that says click to view ReachNC profiles. So when you click this, it will take you to the landing page of ReachNC. This is a basic listing. You'll see a welcome page. And you'll see right here all the organizations in REACH that are listed on the site, from Appalachian State University to Duke to UNC Chapel Hill, NC State to Winston-Salem State University, which is an HBCU in Winston-Salem in North Carolina, a historically black college. So you can browse the site by clicking through um, any of these. So I can click Duke Pratt School of Engineering. And again, I'm sorry, it's a little bit slow. But it pulls up, again, the sub-department. And I'll click Biomedical Engineering. And it shows you, hopefully, the list of experts at Duke who are in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. So I'm doing this completely um, um, off the cuff, but I also wanted to show you the search bar when that economic developer contacted me about this biogas project. I went to Reach NC and I typed in biogas in the search bar. And it should pull up that, find expert below by selecting a concept, biofuels, biogas. So they've matched it, the site has matched inquiry as best as it could and found 14 experts in biogas in the engineering and physical sciences realm. So when I click on that, it expands to give me the list of 14 people who are listed as an expert in biogas. I have the option to add methane gas, anaerobic digestion related concepts if I want to narrow the search further. I can click on anyone's name. I'm just going to pick the first person, Dr. Jay Cheng. And I land on his profile page. So Dr. Chang is at NC State University. He's in the Biological and Agricultural Engineering Department at the College of Engineering, Agriculture and Life Sciences. Excuse me. So what ReachNC allows you to do is very quickly see um, a snapshot of his expertise. He is an expert in enzymatic hydrolysis, ethanol, bioethanol, sugars. So. Dr. Cheng is an expert in biogas, but maybe not in methane gas. So I'm going to go, I just hit the back button, and I'm going to choose Dr. Barlaz at NC State's College of Engineering. So Dr. Cheng might have been a good um, candidate for some other project, but maybe not for, for my um, methane gas project. So again, I apologize if this is taking a while. I'm going to click over to another expert's profile just to show you what a profile page looks like again. This is Dr. Barry Popkin. He's one of the nation's leading obesity researchers. And you may have seen him. He has had appearances on CNN, The Morning Show, and he's written several popular books about diabetes, public health, and obesity. So you can see very quickly from his profile that um, he's an expert in obesity, diet, energy intake, and he does quite a lot of global work as well. Here you see a list of his publications starting with the most recent first. ReachNC is updated weekly to stay current. You could see similar experts, the journals he's published in, his graphs, which are also updated um, automatically from a, from a uh, data poll. And you could see how many people he's connected to. You see his institutional network, his co-authors, um, external organizations, and external folks that Dr. Popkin has published with. If you click on the research network and the visualization works as it's supposed to, you'll see a graph of how Dr. Barlas is connected to his co-authors. So you could search, again, by concept, by last name. You could browse the listings. You could look at grants. You could look at patents, if that person has any that we've loaded into ReachNC. And pretty quickly find someone and look at their, you know, just look at their body of work to see um, what their expertise is. So I'm going to exit the live demo right now. So 
good. And go back to my slideshow. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the impact that we're already starting to see in our next steps that we have planned for Reach NC. So we've had more than 230,000 visitors to the website, of which 216 were unique over the past year. So that translates to about 1,000 hits a day, which given that we're still growing and given that we haven't done much marketing and publicity, we've not done a press release, I've not done a statewide tour, I think um, it's heartening for me to see this. About 20% of people who use Reach NC are the core group of return visitors, so the economic developers, the university administrators, the folks who are using it on a daily basis or for reporting. So what we have um, lined up for next year is we're expanding to include those additional profiles, so another close to 9,000 profiles that we're looking to release. So hopefully by early 2014, Reach NC will contain about 17,000 expert profiles across the state of North Carolina. We recently contracted with an external evaluation firm to do a um, objective evaluation of REACH NC. So we had laid out some goals and objectives that we wanted to meet. And um, the evaluator looked at the web statistics, conducted interviews with users of REACH NC, and, and found that we are meeting our objectives to increase awareness of expertise within the state of North Carolina and to create administrative efficiency. So I think I will leave you here, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm going to um, change the screen. I'm going to hand it back over to Jennifer. Hey, thank you so much. Um, let me go my screen here. Okay, um, so I have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, first one up. Uh, sort of a general question, both of you could talk about this. Um, if, a, if a state policymaker, somebody perhaps in economic development, wanted to start uh, using some of these systems or wanted to begin um, developing something similar to Reach and C, where do you suggest they start? What, what, what's the first step? So this is Shalini. I would suggest, uh, firstly, I would like to say that it's not a short process. There's a lot of behind the work, behind the scenes work that goes on before something like this can be launched. I know the development of Reach NC was at least two years from the inception to the launch. Um, I would suggest they start by gathering their stakeholders, seeing if their key institutions are interested, and seeing if they have the constituents to help um, make the case for such a system within the university, within their universities and their economic development community. Yeah, um, and what we've seen is that it's, uh, in many cases, there are one or two universities already in the state using these systems. Uh, this is something that was mandated at NIH, so it really started at major medical schools. Uh, but in addition to Reach NC, we've linked up all the schools in Michigan, um, and a portal has been built there specifically for small and mid-sized enterprises to find academic expertise engineering, consulting, et cetera. We've linked up the nine medical schools in Texas. Uh, we have a statewide system in Arizona and Nebraska, and we're talking to other states. But I think it's very helpful to have one or two of your universities already using these systems. Virtually all the universities are, keep these profiles fully public. They're easily available on the web. If you search in Google, they show up at the top of the search list. Um, but I think it's both a bottom, uh, a kind of a top-down effort from the statewide level, but also a bottom-up effort from the universities tends to make this happen most quickly and most most effectively. Okay. Um, another question: uh, Are the expert profiles and the information in them? How are they? Uh, how does that information get up into the system? Is are they validated, or is the information self-loaded, self-submitted? So uh, this comes from a Scopus database, which is uh, indexes content from over 20,500 uh, uh, scientific technical medical journals uh, from over 5,000 scientific publishers. This is something that Elsevier brings to the table. We've got deep expertise in this area. 
And we use advanced semantic technologies to create the very detailed profiles that Charlene showed you. Uh, and then all the automation and essentially 90 to 95 percent of the site maintenance is all done by us. So we're sending the automatic publication, uh, the automatic publications, updates every week, et cetera. And in addition to doing a great deal of disambiguation, deduplication of names, we also curate every single profile manually. Um, so we have uh, advanced algorithms doing this, but we also have people looking at these profiles because it's extremely important that they be accurate. So this is Shalini. I'll just add to that. Um, the, uh, I'm sorry. The, the automatic, yeah. yeah, the automatic population of profiles was key to the success of ReachNC. We know faculty members are very busy. They have many demands upon their time. If you ask them to update yet another system once a week. I highly doubt it would get done. Um, but in addition to the peer-reviewed publications that Daniel mentioned, ReachNC also displays grants. So for our public universities, this information is public. We report it to our state legislature every year. So we have an internal system-wide database where people enter in their grants as they get them. We've worked with Elsevier to create a, um, for those people who have technical knowledge, a web API, so an, an ability to pull that data from our system into ReachNC. So that is updated once every two weeks. We also have patents, and the patents, we don't have as many. They don't change as often, so we send a list to Elsevier every few months. And there is also the ability for a motivated expert or faculty member to log in and manually enter more information. We're, we're exploring ways in the near future to add more sources of information and more sources of scholarship. Um, we're also exploring ways to import our course catalog into ReachNC so you can see what people are teaching. Yeah, we're, we're also trying to come up with more automated ways for those, say, arts and humanities faculty uh, who do less work in the peer-reviewed journal uh, space so that they can upload CVs, even things like dance performances, um, exhibitions, film screenings, et cetera. OK, um, one more question. Uh, are there any particular industries or clusters of industries that you think this, this, these systems um, are, work better with? Uh, is there, are there particular areas, biotechnology, that sort of thing, where this is a, a particular um, use when connecting economic development officials and private industry to these groups? Is there anything in particular? Absolutely. I'd say, um, you know, a lot of this is, again, dependent on what information we can find easily, right? And, and those peer-reviewed papers are very well representative of the biomedical sciences, the life sciences, and engineering. And then especially with economic developers, I think when you get into those highly technical questions, such as the, um, the methane gas landfill example that I mentioned earlier, those types of inquiries, I think ReachNC in particular is very helpful for. So when it's very highly technical, um, biomedicine, engineering, so far is what we've used ReachNC for. But in the future, we'll also be expanding to include our business school, education schools, and law schools, and things like that. So, so yet to be seen, I think, is the answer. Yeah, typically, what the, the STEM fields are of great interest to manufacturers for obvious reasons. But there are also people looking at social sciences, other capabilities there, economics, uh, as she said, law and business school. And those can be very well represented as well within the Okay. Well, thank you both for, for coming uh, and, and speaking with us today. Do you have any final thoughts, or would you like to, to leave, in, leave the audience with any final thoughts? I just wanted to thank everybody for taking time out of busy days today uh, to tune in. If there are any follow-up questions, uh, we'll certainly circulate, um, we'll certainly circulate uh, my contact information through, uh, uh, through CSG. And thank you again for attending.
Okay, um, and uh, if anybody would like to watch this webinar again, it will be up on our website at www.csg.org forward slash webinars uh, in the next couple of days. And that will include uh, a video of this webinar presentation as well as additional materials. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.